Hi friends, Father Kerry Walters here, pastor of Holy Spirit American National Catholic Church, and this is another Holy Spirit moment. This one on why Bertrand Russell's teapot argument simply will not fly, or perhaps I should say will not orbit. In 1952, the British philosopher Bertrand Russell wrote an article for a popular magazine on why he disbelieved in God. Now, in the course of the article, he rehearses a few pretty conventional and not terribly convincing arguments against belief in God. But he ends the article with an analogy. It's called the teapot argument that has captured the imaginations and the fidelity of many atheists since, most notably that most unreflective of all atheists, Richard Dawkins. The teapot argument or the teapot analogy then is quite famous and many atheists consider it to be a knockdown, drag out refutation of God belief. But alas, it is far from that. Here's what Russell says. Suppose a person comes to you and tells you that there is a teapot in outer space that is orbiting the sun. And perhaps that same person goes on to tell you that this teapot is so infinitesimally small that the most powerful telescope in the world will never be able to pick it up. And finally, what if this person says to you, now because you cannot disprove that this teapot exists, you must believe in it. Wouldn't that claim, says Russell, be patent nonsense? Now, it's clear what he's trying to do in the context of an argument about God's existence, isn't it? He's saying the teapot is like God. You've never seen God, and yet people tell you that God exists. And moreover, they tell you because you can't disprove the existence of God, you really must believe in the existence of God. Wouldn't that likewise, Russell says, be patent nonsense? Now, even though I think that the teapot argument, the teapot analogy, is fallacious, I do think that lying behind it are two perfectly reasonable philosophical principles. The first principle is that we ought to accept no claim which hasn't been backed up by sufficient evidence. And the second proposition is that the burden of proof, the onus of demonstration, properly lies upon a person making the claim, not the person denying the claim. It's just that in the context of the teapot argument, both of these very reasonable propositions get manhandled. And as a consequence, the teapot analogy really does not put a lid on the coffin of God belief. Let me explain what I mean. Take the first proposition that we ought not to accept a claim without sufficient evidence. That is absolutely true. But what Russell has done when comparing God to a teapot is to beg the question. He has assumed that the existence of God has no more evidence in its favor than the existence of the celestial teapot. But he hasn't really examined thoroughly and exhaustively all of the evidential claims for the existence of God. And therefore, he is merely assuming what in point of fact he ought to be demonstrating. In other words, even though he wants to draw an analogy between evidence for the teapot and evidence for God, the analogy simply doesn't hold up. That's the first objection. Here's the second objection. What Russell seems to be doing is confusing unprovenness with unbelievableness. Uh, what he should be doing is equating intrinsic absurdity with unbelievability. It is the case that that teapot's existence cannot be proven or disproven. But that doesn't make belief in the teapot, or to use the analogy, in God, absolutely impossible. It is impossible to believe in the existence of the orbiting teapot because the notion of an orbiting teapot is inherently absurd. The only way that the analogy will work is if you can likewise demonstrate that the existence of a God is inherently absurd. Simply being unproven is not going to be sufficient. So once again, the teapot analogy breaks down. And here's a third objection. Notice that the reasonable proposition is no claim should be accepted without evidence. But what Russell has done is to change that reasonable proposition 
when speaking about God into this. No claim about God should be accepted unless it has been proven. That's an extremely rigorous standard to apply, and we rarely apply it for any of our other beliefs, do we? Almost all of the beliefs that you and I hold as true cannot be proven beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's what the word proof means, to be shown with absolute certainty. No, most of the beliefs that you and I hold, we hold on the basis of probability. We have arrived at them through induction, not deduction. When you think about it, my friends, the only truths that can be proven tend to be logical and mathematical ones. So what Russell is doing here is insisting upon a standard that is much more rigorous than he would insist upon in any other area of investigation except mathematics, perhaps, or logic. And here's the fourth objection to his misapplication of that first principle. It's um, offered us by uh, the philosopher Brian Garvey. Garvey says that the analogy simply is no good for this reason. The teapot is a specific concrete object, but God is something quite different from that. God cannot be compared to a specific object in the world. It doesn't make any difference if you believe or disbelieve in God's existence. Whatever God can be, if we can talk meaningfully about even the possibility of God, God is not like a discrete, concrete object in the world. Teapot and God are not in any way analogous, says Brian Garvey, and therefore the teapot argument simply doesn't work. So for these four reasons, the first reasonable proposition embedded in the teapot analogy gets distorted and twisted. What about the second proposition that's embedded? That is the proposition about the uh, burden of proof. You know, sometimes it certainly is the case that the burden of proof is upon the claimant. The burden of proof is upon the person who is defending a proposition and not a person who is denying the proposition. But when it comes to arguments about the existence of God, we ought not to take that kind of a rather um, straightforward and unimaginative forensics approach. It's not a trial. It's not the case that it is up to the prosecution to prove the, the uh, guilt of the defendant. And all the defendant has to do is to remain silent until and unless the prosecution makes its case. No. In this particular case, we're examining a question on which the entire meaning of the universe rests, whether or not there is a God who created everything that is and who is in relationship with everything that is. Now, it certainly is the case that a person who makes that kind of claim should be offering arguments in its defense. But it's also the case because of the sheer weight the sheer importance of the discussion that individuals who disagree with the theist's claim should be offering their own arguments as well to claim, as Russell seems to be suggesting, that a person who believes in God simply uh, has to do all of the hard work and that a person who disbelieves in God can simply sit back with a kind of smirky expression on his or her face and remain silent just doesn't seem to be a reasonable um, portrait of the spirit of inquiry, particularly when so much is resting on the truth or the falsehood of the claim that there is a God. So my friends, Bertrand Russell's teapot simply will not fly. It is a faulty argument. But to give Russell his due, I don't at all think that he placed as much weight upon this particular analogy as people like Richard Dawkins or Carl Sagan before him or the inventor of the flying spaghetti monster themselves do. It was a kind of clever throwaway on Russell's part. But if one isn't very well versed in philosophical theology, and Richard Dawkins is not, then it's entirely possible to place more weight in this analogy than Russell himself probably put and more weight than philosophical analysis 
will certainly allow it. I'm Father Terry Walters, and this has been another Holy Spirit moment. Thank you so much for watching. Please remain safe during the year uh, COVID epidemic. I will see you again soon. God bless.